All right, when everyone is ready, we can go ahead and start. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome and thank you for attending this panel discussion on wildlife trafficking in the maritime industry, co-sponsored by the International Section's International Animal Law Committee and the Tort Trial and Insurance Practice Section's Admiralty and Maritime Law Committee. My name is Elizabeth Niles. I am a co-chair of the International Animal Law Committee's Wildlife Crime Working Group, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Today's webinar will begin with a presentation providing background on how wildlife and wildlife products are trafficked via the maritime supply chain before turning to a panel discussion. Throughout the panel discussion, all audience members are welcomed and encouraged to post questions in the Zoom chat or Q&A function. And we will try to address as many questions as possible, either during the panel discussion or at the end. With that, I would like to introduce our four panelists. Monica Savagli is a wildlife trade expert with over 14 years of international experience in the field of environmental justice and sustainable development. She is currently leading the transport sector engagement of a joint initiative led by the Wildlife Trade Monitoring Network Traffic and the World Wildlife Fund on disrupting maritime wildlife trafficking routes. Her work encompasses partnership development capacity building, and technical assistance across government agencies, trade associations, and United Nations agencies. She has been she is based in Bangkok, Thailand for the past nine years. Prior to that, she has worked in Eastern and Southern Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. Mark Slomek is a captain on active duty in the U.S. Coast Guard. He is currently a military fellow at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Mark has served in a variety of operational and legal assignments over his 22 year Coast Guard career. He has also been assigned to the Department of State's Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, served as the general counsel for a major counter drug task force and worked as a staff attorney for multinational force Iraq. He holds degrees from the United States Coast Guard Academy, Tulane University and UC Berkeley. Nicole Phillips is a partner in Montgomery McCracken Walker and Rhodes litigation department and a member of the firm's white collar and government investigations group. Prior to joining Montgomery McCracken, Nicole served as an assistant US attorney in the criminal division of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. As an AUSA in the narcotics unit, Nicole prosecuted individuals for federal drug trafficking, trafficking offenses, public corruption, tax and bank fraud conspiracies, and Hobbs Act robbery. Nicole is based in Philadelphia. Eric Chang is, is an associate in Montgomery McCracken's litigation department and maritime and transportation practice group. Eric has represented some of the largest ocean carriers in connection with US customs and border protection penalties for smuggling and remission, for smuggling and stowaway penalties including obtaining complete mitigation and remission of the assessed penalties. Eric also regularly counsels non-vessel operating common carrier and freight forwarder clients concerning bills of lading and cargo operations. Eric is based in New York. With that, I would like to turn it over to Monica for a background presentation on wildlife trafficking via maritime supply chains. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I'd like to start first to, um, to remind everyone that uh, wildlife trade uh, um, exists and the majority of it is actually legal and is regulated by national legislations and internationally by the CITES convention. Um, with regard to wildlife trafficking, it's a bit difficult to pinpoint the exact sort of value for like for any illicit trade, but it is basically, um, uh, valued as the fourth largest illegal trade after drugs, arms, and human trafficking. In the past decades, we have seen uh, um, a much in higher increase in uh, sort of uh, political, high level political attention to this issue, but it's still be perceived as a, a low risk and high profit uh, business by traffickers. 
the growing uh, wildlife trafficking uh, is growing is uh, is driven by um, growing demands in uh, in Asia, what we would call the nouveau riche. Uh, there is more disposable income and uh, and uh, stronger growing desires for uh, wildlife, endangered animals, endangered species uh, to. Um, um, for products um, like traditional medicine in the pet trade or like high-end uh, furniture, if you think of, uh, of timber. And uh, as the biodiversity in Asia is declining, there is a lot, a lot of pressures on natural resources in other regions. Africa is one of those, if we think of uh, the illicit trade in ivory and pangolin scales, because these uh, animals, elephants and pangolins just occur uh, either in Africa or in Asia, but overall other biodiversity rich countries and regions like Latin America are affected by this. And uh, so we really have to see it as a, not a problem of just one country or, or, very, uh, or very sort of regionalized issues, but it's a global issue that has a really big detrimental uh, effects not only on biodiversity, but of course, uh, it also like creates uh, big impacts on local livelihoods. Often uh, in poor countries, people rely on, uh, on tourism derived by wild, uh, wildlife um, attractions, let's say, or like uh, natural parks where these resources are depleted. But it's also uh, a really, um, yeah, a really huge impact and a threat to national security and stability. We see armed poachers, rangers get killed, and it's just fueled by corruptions. Uh, and of course, also lots of national, loss of a national uh, revenues because uh, traffickers don't pay customs duties. Um, and I guess we all seen, we all sort of thought about wildlife trade throughout this year with the COVID pandemic as well. By its definitions, the illegal trade in wildlife uh, does not pass through proper hygiene, sanitary, and phytosanitary um, controls, and uh, and can potentially lead to the spread of a zoonotic disease, like it has been in the past. If we think of SARS and even Ebola, and now the possible link to pangolin as intermediate uh, for um, uh, SARS-CoV-19. Traffickers are highly reliant on uh, legitimate transport services, air, land, road, by sea, to move nationally and transnationally uh, these products, putting at risk um, the very legitimate services that they're abused by, uh, by traffickers. Risks that can range between uh, just reputational, uh, there is a an increasing media attention, expose that point names and peoples and companies. So if it's put in a sort of negative light, of course, it's not great publicity. Two other form of uh, what we would say like commercial risks uh, from economic loss uh, due to impoundments of containers or um, yeah, or also legal, uh, legal cases um, and, and prosecutions. Just diving in into the uh, into into the maritime uh, transport that we have seen the uh, trafficking happening uh, throughout all the different modes of maritime, uh, from container ships to non-commercial boats, cruise lines, uh, fishing vessels, and the ports uh, offer um, always a great opportunity as a bottleneck for interception of uh, of these illicit shipments. Now, looking specifically at containerized cargo. Um, we can quickly um, realize that uh, the supply chains is really complex and it involves a, a number of transactions for each container. There are at least 30, 40 documents that are prepared for invoice, packing list and the insurance and bill of ladings to the many different locations that the containers has to pass and at least like 25 different actors that get sort of involved in, in the movement in a, a longer, an international um, supply chain. So of course, all of these uh, points along the supply chains uh, offers vulnerability that are exploited by traffickers. And uh, while uh, volume wise, uh, um, almost uh, half, like 50% of the illicit wildlife, uh, wildlife trade passes through containerized um, cargo, basically. For some commodities, it's even higher than that. And uh, 
we know very well that this is just a small percentage of, uh, of, the, of the real uh, trafficking. And so what we know comes from uh, seizures data, from intelligence. Normally these products uh, smuggled through containers are um, non-perishable, are big volumes, like heavy weights. We can think of uh, timber, elephant tasks, pangolin scales, uh, shark fins, other kind of uh, uh, dried uh, sea life, like sea cucumbers and seahorses, but also donkey skins and shells as well as uh, peels that might contain CITES protected species and that you know, don't uh, receive the rights, so that they don't comply with the uh, certificates and permits required by uh, the convention. These products are typically uh, hidden in sacks, in bags, concealed like under, normally at the back of a container or like under um, legitimate, um, uh, commodities that get used, that they get declared. Um, normally these the commodities are um, somewhat low price, I would say, and uh, we see lots of uh, like plastic derivatives, uh, plastic straps, uh, resins, but also agricultural and forest products like nuts and coffees. Often uh, the exporting countries will use, the trafficker in the exporting country will use uh, uh, the typical agricultural products from that country. There were some cases a few years ago of uh, il, um, ivory shipments from Kenya and they were declared as uh, tea leaves. And as you know, like Kenya is, uh, is one of the biggest like uh, tea leaves exporters and also benefits countries that import from them benefits of uh, some sort of like uh, customs uh, duty reductions and things like that. There is also an exploitation of uh, smuggling using lookalike species. So uh, very similar, but some are protected and some are not. So if you don't have, if you're a custom officer and you are not trained in species identification it would be very difficult to believe what is in, what is in there. And of course, use of uh, fraudulent, fraudulent uh, documentations, uh, tampering, forging, falsifications of permits. And, um, and often, uh, yeah, traffickers and uh, sort of consigners, shippers get by just by putting very vague descriptions, sometimes lacking a DHS uh, codes from uh, WCO and just, you know, saying fish products and then uh, using uh, uh, fake front shell companies to hide their true identity. Um, they are normally not very creative, I would say, but sometimes uh, they are. And this is an example from last year where uh, they had a, there was a, a timber shipment, but actually after some checks, so they and they saw that uh, the logs were hollowed out. They were filled with the ivory tusks and pangolin scales and covered in wax and then recovered again. Uh, and it would, you know, normally we see this modus operandi being repeated over time until they get caught, basically. Um, but it's normally it's just hiding, uh, you know, in sacks and things like that. Um, I wanted to uh, present two sort of case studies specific to shark fin trafficking and and also the timber the timber trade because they present um, some challenges around the, the legalities. Um, the vast majority of, uh, of uh, shark fins are, are actually exported to the, the East and in particular Hong Kong, which is uh, uh, one of the largest importer of shark fins. But many countries around the world are actually involved in this trade, which is uh, partly uh, legal and partly illegal when uh, uh, CITES protected species in Appendix 1 or 2 are actually uh, non-declared or, or, or harvested uh, uh, fish without uh, like CITES permit. And um, uh, the US doesn't, uh, doesn't really sort of play a major role um, in, um, in the consumption or, or, or even uh, sort of as origin for these shark fins, but actually it's a transport powerhouse for, uh, for this market. Um, you probably also know that um, the U.S. has uh, uh, existing legislations in 13 uh, uh, states and, and three territories that uh, um, uh, forbid uh, the consumptions of um, shark fins. 
but still they do play a role because uh, the majority of the countries in Latin America and Central America that exports to the East uh, will transit through uh, the US. And uh, so it will be some legal shipments, but also the illegal shipments. And this will be via containerized cargo, but also air transport, uh, depending on, yeah, on, on the routes and, and trafficking, uh, traffickers wishes, basically. Uh, there was a case uh, in 2017 of um, an illicit cargo of uh, scheduled uh, shark um, species uh, that was declared as uh, cucumbers and gherkins so that was uh, stopped at the port of Auckland. So this is just um, to prove that um, yeah, the country uh, do play uh, a role in this. And uh, similarly, also timber trafficking um, does uh, it has relevance for for the US? Um, Interpol estimates that between fifteen and thirty percent of the global like timber trade comes from illegally sourced uh, timber, and the US has a, a good legislation in place. One of the few countries that actually also recognize foreign uh, uh, foreign laws, and uh, this is very useful for timber because. Uh, um, beside those species that they are listed under CITES, there is also uh, species that are protected at a national level with the full or partial bans, and um, and so the U.S. can actually like stop shipments if they come uh, into the country. Um, um, Nicole and uh, and Eric will will talk, I'm sure, a little bit more about uh, the Lacey Act. Um, and there was a case a few years ago of uh, a tip-off that U.S. Customs received uh, by Peruvian authorities that realized that, that there was a, an illegal shipment of illegally sourced um, timber from the uh, from the Amazonia that was uh, coming arriving at the port of Houston, um, and so the U.S. government uh, managed to um, yeah to stop it and and. To prosecute uh, all the actors involved in that. So, just to conclude this presentation, uh, when we look at these shipments, the sheer amount of volumes of illegal commodities that passes like across countries, jurisdictions, continents, the number of people that have to be involved, the number of processes, in the money that. Uh, uh, is dispatched throughout the trafficking chain is a clear sign of presence of organized crime. And this is very, very specific also to, yeah, to the containerized cargo. And I'm not talking about the passenger that by another bungle, um, you know, the tourist in Kenya uh, to bring it home. But I'm talking about like tons and tons or thousands of pounds of illegal products that get sourced. And this is also like fueled, it's entrenched with a, uh, deep corruptions at uh, local level, uh, not only in government agencies and officials, but also uh, within the private sector uh, ecosystem. And uh, just the last piece of information, which I thought it was uh, actually, in a way, very important as a statement by the US government to be very serious about this is a recent uh, law that was uh, passed uh, that limit uh, the visa to persons and their families uh, uh, that have been implicated in uh, timber and wildlife trafficking from abroad to visit uh, the US. This is a clear statement that uh, the, the government is uh, taking a serious, uh, uh, strong stand on the issue. And um, I'll conclude here and we can talk more during the panel discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, that was very helpful. Mark, can you walk us through the applicable legal framework we should have in mind when thinking about trafficking in the maritime industry in general? Sure, absolutely. Uh, under international maritime law, there are really two sources of jurisdiction, flag state jurisdiction and, and coastal state jurisdiction. When the vessel is on the high seas, it's subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the flag state. That is the nation which grants nationality to the vessel the nation whose flag the vessel flies, thus the term flag state. When the vessel is within 12 nautical miles of the coast, it is subject to the jurisdiction of the coastal state, with a few exceptions, uh, but generally subject to the jurisdiction of the coastal state. 
Now, if we move back to uh, thinking about the context where the vessel is on the high seas, we really can understand that there's a tyranny of distance problem. The flag state, which again has exclusive jurisdiction, can be thousands of miles removed from where the vessel is plying its trade, uh, leading to an enforcement conundrum. Now, in some trafficking vectors, uh, I'm thinking drug trafficking, migrant smuggling, uh, the international community has come together to address this problem um, through the development of uh, conventions and treaties. So an example of that is the 1988 United Nations Convention Against Illicit Trafficking in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances. Uh, the 88 convention has a 190 states party, so it's widely adopted. And it lays out a framework for states to work together to get, get after trafficking on the high seas. And it encourages states to enter into bilateral and multilateral agreements in furtherance of the purposes of the convention. So the United States is a party to the 88 convention. Perhaps more importantly, the United States has entered into bilateral and multilateral agreements with countries all over the world uh, to interdict drugs at sea. And so how that works is we will identify a vessel that we believe is engaged in narcotics trafficking. We will reach out to the flag state that we have a bilateral agreement with, and we will provide the flag state with our reasonable suspicion factors, why we think the, the vessel is engaged in drug trafficking. We'll then ask the flag state based on that reasonable suspicion to have authorization to stop board and search the vessel. And if pursuant to the search, we find contraband, we'll then re-engage with the flag state to identify an appropriate judicial ends. Now that may very well mean a prosecution by the flag state. More often than not, however, in the drug context, uh, it means that we request that the flag state waive jurisdiction in favor of the United States exercising jurisdiction over the vessel in the United States courts. And when that happens, the Maritime Drug Law Enforcement Act has extraterritorial jurisdiction provisions built into it, such that we can have a seamless transition from the international legal construct to the domestic criminal construct. Now, I provide all of that because it really is the gold standard of how you get after trafficking in the maritime domain. Um, unfortunately, not all of that overarching framework exists for wildlife trafficking. Um, we then have to kind of fall back to the territorial jurisdiction construct, the, the coastal state jurisdiction that I mentioned earlier. And we have jurisdiction in the United States when the vessel comes into US waters and indeed into US ports, at which point the Lacey Act applies. And we have certainly the Endangered Species Act as well. And I know uh, that Nicole and Eric will speak to both of those uh, as we move through the discussion. As far as the US law enforcement agencies that are at play here, it's really a whole of government approach to get after this problem. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service plays a leading role, as does the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but Customs and Border Protection, Homeland Security Investigations, Coast Guard, uh, like I said, it, it's a whole of government approach. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn it back over. Thanks, Mark. Nicole and Eric, uh, Mark mentioned the Lacey Act and the Endangered Species Act. Can you walk us through the relevant laws with respect to wildlife trafficking here in the US? Uh, sure. So uh, like Mark mentioned, uh, the first applicable law in the US is the Lacey Act. Um, that's the Lacey Act of 1900, which is the US's oldest conservation law. And it's the primary statute in the US protecting plants and wildlife and regulating illegal trade. Um, it's, in, it's primarily enforced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, like, Mark, like Mark touched upon, it's closely supported by other agencies, in this case, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Customs and Border Protection, and even Homeland Security. Um, along with the Lacey Act, there is the Endangered Species Act, which, like the name suggests, uh, focuses on the protection of endangered plants and animals. And the Endangered Species Act sets out a, a general prohibition on any import, export, 
or foreign trade of species identified under the act. Um, specifically, it tax on additional penalties if a designated endangered species is involved. And the two are closely related, um, for example, in part, because it require, they, they both require uh, importers to declare any wildlife that enters the country. Um, of course, animals and living wildlife are somewhat less of a concern in the container trade. Um, but like Monica mentioned, plant material, uh, especially wood products and illegally harvested timber is also one of the focuses under the Lacey Act. And the Lacey Act has been very successful uh, in reducing the import of illegal timber that enters the US. And for example, in 2016, I believe, Lumber Liquidators was prosecuted um, under the Lacey Act because they had imported timber, which turned out to be illegally logged uh, from Russia. Uh, so along with the Lacey Act and the Endangered Species Act, probably most importantly, we have the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And that's CITES, which Monica just mentioned, uh, C-I-T-E-S. It's sometimes referred to as the Washington Convention because the text was signed in uh, Washington, D.C. And this is the main international treaty focused on keeping species uh, from becoming endangered or extinct because of international trade. Uh, CITES regulates more than 30,000 species of plants, um, I believe over 5,000 species of animals. And there are more than 183 countries which are signatories, including many of the countries that have significant numbers of endangered species, such as China and Mexico. Uh, the U.S. is also a signatory, and um, sad to say, the U.S. is also one of those countries that are in the top 10 of endangered species. Um, so, so those are some of the laws that uh, apply domestically. And uh, what happens when you violate these laws? There are civil and criminal penalties. Um, on the civil side, we're primarily talking about monetary penalties, which can be quite severe, uh, even for a misdemeanor violation, which is when goods are valued at less than $350. The penalty can be up to 200,000 for organizations. And if you have a felony penalty, which is when goods are valued at more, more than $350, um, the penalty can be up to 500,000 for corporations. So it's quite severe. And that's not even counting penalties which can be assessed by customs and other agencies when there are violations of their regulations as well. Um, on the criminal side, um, Nicole can present some more information and discuss some of the prosecutions that have taken place uh, relating to the Lacey Act uh, and CITES. Thank you, Eric. Um, so while we've seen in um, the US not as many cases directly related to container ships and vessels, I think there's still several cases that have been prosecuted in the US um, that are instructive in terms of what the risks are and what the penalties are facing those that are prosecuted for wildlife trafficking under the Lacey Act and related uh, statutes. Um, I wanted to just talk about some of the goods, the, the common goods that we've seen trafficked um, and wildlife trafficked here in the US. And these are all related to cases that have been prosecuted. Um, the primary agencies, uh, governmental entities that are prosecuting these cases start with the Department of Justice um, headquarters, the Department of Environmental Crimes, usually um, initiate or work on these types of cases and they work on them in conjunction with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the relevant jurisdiction of where the crime has occurred, where the trafficked uh, goods have come in. And so common um, goods, wildlife, fauna that we've seen come into the US. And these, these goods that I'm gonna talk about are all related to cases that have been prosecuted. We commonly see elephant ivory. We see black rhino horn, exotic birds, turtles, um, diamondback terrapins that are um, being trafficked to China. Uh, we had an interesting case in 2015 of South African lobsters. I'll go, come back to that in just a moment. Um, we've seen uh, cases in 2019, several cases were prosecuted um, by the Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's offices together of uh, birds, parrots, macaws, cockatoos. Um, this particular case in 2019 was uh, the traffickers were based in New Orleans and were shipping these out to Taiwan. 
um, live water monitor lizards from the Philippines, going to the Philippines from a trafficker in New Hampshire. Uh, Monica talked about the shark fin trade um, and there was a big investigation out of Hawaii in 2019. Also, we've seen types of um, exotic um, reptiles, pet pythons, cobra, going from Indonesia here into the United States. And also Monica talked briefly about the dried sea, sea cucumber um, going uh, from California to Mexico. We've seen interagency operations and investigations such as Operation Common Denominator, which again deals with the exotic turtles, um, which is a multi-jurisdictional investigation, as well as Operation Crash, which again was focused on the black rhino horns. I want to talk really quickly about the, um, as I talked about the uh, South African uh, lobsters. They were illegally harvested uh, from South Africa. And again, going back to what Monica said, how sometimes there is a, uh, there is a legal component to this, and then there is a illegal component. And this, in this particular case, these defendants out of the U.S., um, illegally harvested the South African lobsters over the quota that was permitted and brought them into the US. They were, uh, a container was intercepted in South Africa, but the South African authorities did not uh, feel they had jurisdiction to prosecute. So there were certain minimal penalties that were in, uh, imposed. Nevertheless, the South African authorities cooperated with a parallel United States investigation, which ultimately led to the prosecution of these individuals in the US. And what we've often seen in terms of penalties, um, oftentimes we are seeing sentences that involve incarceration. Uh, several months of incarceration, and sometimes that incarceration is uh, in coordination with the value of the wildlife that is trafficked, um, the monetary value. We definitely see fines, significant fines, uh, disgorgement of illegal proceeds, oftentimes uh, times tied to the market value of the wildlife or fauna that is that has been trafficked. In certain instances, we've even seen community service. Um, and probation. But I will say in the research, we see quite a bit of sentences that are incarceration sentences. And then we'll talk about forfeiture a little bit later in the presentation, um, but that is also a very big part of the penalties that are faced. Thank you, Eric and Nicole. Staying on th this topic a little bit more, uh, Eric, you mentioned penalties under the Lacey Act and Nicole, you mentioned the potential for disgorgement and incarceration. What are some of the other consequences, whether commercial or legal, that carriers are facing if they're detained or delayed on suspicions of trafficking? Uh, right. So even in a best case scenario, uh, if there's a cargo seizure, um, there's going to be some form of investigation accompanying it. And this can this typically includes customs or other agencies seizing the container or even going on board the ship to investigate uh, the cargo hold, investigate other containers. Um, customs will often want to interview the, the ship's crew members or officers. And if there is suspicion of a crew being involved, there could be further detainment and removing of crew and officers from the ship for further interviews. And uh, really as a consequence, what this all means is um, there's going to be significant delay and time lost. And while, this, while the investigation is taking place, it means shore operations are delayed. Um, this trickles down to the shore gain, uh, st stevedores, a warehouse standby and overtime. This affects cargo operations and cargo movement. It can affect transshipment of cargo and it can affect charter hire. So all of these are commercially undesirable consequences. Um, aside from that, there are the monetary penalties, which we talked about. Um, separate from the trafficking offenses, customs will often impose its own penalties for violations of customs regulations. And the one we typically see is for violation of the manifest submission requirement, where customs will uh, fine a carrier if it submits a incorrect manifest. Um, in this case, because uh, if the cargo is you know, endangered rhino ivory horn. That, that's obviously not what's going to be listed on the manifest that gets submitted to customs. And, you know, when that happens, with, we're talking about penalties, uh, you know, 5,000 for the first violation, 10,000 for uh, any further violation. It does add up. 
Um, so, and, and then aside from these civil penalties, there are uh, the criminal penalties as well, uh, which Nicole touched upon earlier. And this can include vessel seizure or forfeiture. Um, and for that, I'll turn it over to Nicole. Right, so um, forfeiture is often, in the criminal context, is in tied to the indictment. Um, when there is an indictment or information otherwise charging document, there's going to be a notice of forfeiture that's going to be attached to that. And the focus of the forfeiture is going to be on the illegal proceeds of the crime obtained from the crime. Um, it could be the wildlife or fauna itself um, being recovered and ultimately the vessel or other instrumentalities of the crime, whether whatever method of transport or smuggling that was used. Um, now, in the context of the criminal forfeiture, that becomes viable after the conviction. So once there is a conviction, it is part of the sentence, um, and it is subject to a different uh, adjudicatory hearing if there is not an agreement to forfeiture. What can be forfeited is, is only the defendant's interest in that particular instrumentality. And then it's the government's burden to prove the nexus between the criminal activity and that instrumentality um, or what have you. And so there's a separate process that occurs after conviction. Um, we oftentimes see the forfeiture and I will segue now back a little bit to what Mark talked about in the fact that, and even Monica, um, in the wildlife trafficking space, there are, very, there are similarities between uh, the investigation and prosecution of wildlife trafficking crimes to drug crimes. Um, as we, you've kind of already heard, a lot of this drug traffic, excuse me, wildlife trafficking has similarities in how it occurs to what happens in the drug space. Um, the drugs being uh, concealed in uh, container vessels, in, um, excuse me, in vessels, in containers, in a clandestine sort of way, in hollowed out figures that otherwise look like uh, legally, uh, things that are being legally shipped and what have you. And then, so when you get to um, the space here, um, you start to see some similarities in how the investigations are conducted, similar to what Eric talked about in terms of uh, detainment of crew members, interviewing crew members and gathering evidence, even the types of intelligence that's gathered is similar in the wildlife trafficking space um, to the drug space in terms of uh, finding out about these, these shipments coming from, from tips and other types of intelligence that is used. Um, so that leads me very quickly to talk about, and I'm sorry, uh, Elizabeth, if I'm going a little out of order here, but um, one of very similar case that we had in Philadelphia was the inter, uh, interception of 20 tons of cocaine from the MSC Guyane in the port of Philadelphia. And what happened, uh, particularly in that case and why it's uh, relevant, is the U.S. attorney in, this, uh, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, in the beginning, uh, was very focused on possibly forfeiting the uh, vessel itself as an instrumentality of the crime. Um, ultimately, that did not occur. However, the uh, vessel was seized for a period of time for the, the um, investigation to occur, as Eric already uh, talked about. And ultimately, what occurred was the owner of the vessel had to pay $10 million in cash and sign on a $40 million surety bond so that they can continue on their way and continue doing their work. So that um, is not necessarily an insignificant amount to have to pay and be uh, liable for um, in this space. So these are other things that have to be considered. As the investigation continued, um, the crew members and ultimately uh, were ultimately detained and cooperated with the with the government in order to uh, get to the ultimate suppliers and sources of supply of this cocaine, and they were prosecuted accordingly and cooperated and, and received whatever sentences that they uh, received. But these are other things that need to be considered by owners of vessels and managers of these vessels in terms of what types of um, inconveniences, whether monetary or timing or in the ordinary disruption to the ordinary course of business that it can occur in these types of cases. Thank you, Nicole. Following up on that, and this is probably uh, for you and for Mark, 
You mentioned that in the MSC case, it seemed to start with crew members and then roll up to the carrier. Is that typical in prosecutions like this, that that's how an investigation or the prosecution would proceed starting with lower level individuals? I would say yes, and I'll, I'll defer to Mark um, as well, but I would say yes, because I mean, you know, just thinking about how this goes, if you're at a port, those are the most readily available individuals. And those are the most likely individuals who have been involved in getting this contraband onto the vessel. So that's probably where you're gonna start um, to get information, whether uh, viewing them as a target or a witness, um, and that would be distinguishable and you would have to uh, consider the factors of obtaining counsel for those individuals and then working with the government to understand how the government views their role in this and their position. Um, again, being a target versus a simple witness or a subject of the investigation may um, determine how the course of that investigation is going to go. But, but yes, starting with that lower level, most readily available person as a possible source of information, yes. Mark? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And Nicole summed it up very well. Uh, whenever you get an interdiction, be it in the port or on the, the seas, uh, the folks that you're interdicting are going to be the lowest level actors, uh, but they are very informative uh, to the overall investigation because they can help lead back up the uh, network chain, uh, which is where we ultimately want to go. Thank you. And Eric, you touched on this a little bit, but are there particular, what are the vulner, or what are the kind of vulnerabilities that are specific to the maritime industry that make it more vulnerable uh, or useful for traffickers? Um, right. So some of that is uh, really, I guess, what we'll call the, uh, the unavoidable nature of containerized cargo. Um, like we saw in Monica's presentation, contraband wildlife, it's tucked in or hidden clandestinely in the containers. And we know the carrier typically does not load the container or ever see what goes inside the container. It's the, in fact, the container is loaded and sealed by the shipper and not unsealed until destination. And even those seals can be broken. So all of that means uh, for smugglers and traffickers, they have essentially an instrument which bypasses um, normal routes of detection. And I think Customs understands that. So uh, CBP Customs doesn't really harp on that too much as far as carrier responsibility goes. But there is another factor in the trade which Customs looks at, and that's the fact that containers will sit unattended at terminals um, for days, for hours, for days, for weeks even. And that presents an attractive target for smugglers who are willing to break into the terminal sneak in, open a container up, hide or stuff contraband within the container and reseal the container. Um, so all of that is a vulnerability in the ocean trade that carriers have to address and which customs expects carriers to address. And in fact, customs sets out minimum security criteria in this regard. Um, that's, it's comprehensive, but as far as the terminal goes, customs requires or expects uh, terminals to be gated, um, terminals to have closed circuit uh, video surveillance cameras, um, terminals to be properly lit. And on the vessel side, uh, carriers should have um, security watchmen, uh, you know, roving uh, crew patrol teams, and carriers should have uh, ship security plans, uh, along with instructions to report suspicious activities to the master because uh, without those preventative measures in place, it, it is difficult to combat uh, wildlife trafficking in containers, but some of those steps um, do help the cause. Thank you, Eric. Shifting gears a little bit to talk about developments in the area, what are we seeing as far as new initiatives to combat wildlife trafficking in the maritime industry? So, so I might take that. I know that there was one question in the uh, Q&A box uh, about whether there's anything analogous to the Maritime Drug Law Enforcement Act being thought of in this area. And, and I can't report that there is. However, uh, 
in January of 2019, Representative Garamendi of California introduced the Wildlife Conservation and Anti-Trafficking Act of 2019, excuse me, did I say a uh, wrong date earlier? In 2019, January 2019, Representative Garamendi uh, introduced that act. Um, and that would make wildlife trafficking a predicate offense um, for uh, RICO. Um, so that is one positive in development in, in US law. However, to my understanding, the, the proposal is, is still in committee. And what is uh, the, what's the IMO's role in all of this? Are they also uh, involved in any developments on the horizon? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for, for asking that as well. Um, this past year, uh, Kenya uh, introduced a proposal to the International Maritime Organization's Facilitation Committee uh, to develop guidelines uh, to suppress and uh, discourage, prevent, and suppress uh, international wildlife trafficking in the maritime uh, arena. Um, and those uh, guidelines, uh, the adoption of them uh, is going to be taken up by the next meeting of the facilitation committee. Uh, and it's going to be an interactive development of the guidelines between uh, the IMO, the uh, shipping community, NGOs, and, and governments. And I believe the uh, goal is to have those guidelines developed by 2022. Um, and I, I'll defer to Monica because I believe she was involved with uh, uh, some of Kenya's initial work on that. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, um, these guidelines will be developed through a consultative approach uh, that will include the government state members of the IMO, uh, also private sector representatives through the United for Wildlife Transport Task Force. I will tell you a little bit more later what it is. And also the NGO community. So traffic WWF, but also like um, UN agencies like UNDP will be involved in this consultative process to develop the guidelines that we are expecting uh, well, it's a sort of fairly long process, actually. So they still have to pass, the proposal still have to be uh, fully approved by IMO Council in uh, July 2021. So only after that, uh, a full draft can be submitted. So we're looking at uh, spring 2022 at the earliest, but the plan is to try to have a, um, a full as possible developed uh, draft for the guidelines that is supported by sponsor countries. So it might pass uh, at that um, at, um, FAL 46, otherwise we're looking for uh, another year in, in process. But uh, this is very positive. Um, it's a very positive um, um, uh, movement. It's very good to see that at regulatory uh, level, uh, there are this kind of uh, sort of higher level commitments by government. The IMO is also a member, one of the 120 members of the United for Wildlife Transport Task Force. That is a global initiative by the Royal Foundations of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And uh, the task force aimed to mobil mobilize uh, the private sector. So in this case, uh, shipping lines, airlines, uh, couriers, but also like um, governments, uh, government agencies and, and NGOs uh, to really uh, try to um, put in place like actionable um, response to wildlife trafficking through uh, intelligence sharing between the private sector and, uh, and the government. Um, as well as a sort of creating tools and uh, awareness uh, around uh, around the sector. There is also a sister uh, task force uh, that focuses on uh, on the finance uh, with the bank banks involving banks uh, looking at financial crime, which also links back to what um, uh, Nicole and, and Mark mentioned about um, sort of money laundry and you know all the issues related to um, illicit illicit financial trade. Thank you, Monica. So we've heard a lot about the background and how wildlife trafficking occurs in the maritime industry, and then how prosecutions occur and the developments on the horizon. What are some best practices or risk assessments that maritime companies can use now to prevent uh, themselves from becoming unwitting participants in illegal trafficking? 
the question is to me, right? <laughs> um, yeah, if I can uh, respond to this. So uh, first of all, it's really important to implement robust uh, due diligence procedures uh, cannot be underestimated as a key uh, risk mitigation for that. So due diligence uh, for uh, uh, shipper on the shippers and due diligence also on the contractors uh, uh, for shipping lines, if we think of uh, uh, their work uh, or their interface with, uh, with the freight forwarders or with the clearing agents or all the other sort of contractors that uh, interact with the consigner and shippers, it's very important that uh, the good practice are also um, delivered by these contractors in a way, and also uh, due diligence on, on shipments. It's uh, if you don't know what you're looking out for, uh, you will, you know, you will not be able to detect any um, any anomalies in the cargo, any uh, any issues or, or, or suspicious uh, um, uh, sort of yeah uh, documentations for possible uh, for possible smuggling. So actually, what uh, um, you know, there is a. Um, as we know, uh, already a lot of uh, systems that have been put in place uh, uh, for uh, sort of in, to improve risk assessments, uh, looking at the other illicit uh, trade, if we think of dangerous goods, uh, like these big carriers uh, are, you know, very well trained to detect uh, this, this type of goods. But for uh, wildlife products, uh, um, they often lack of information. So what we've been doing in collaboration with the uh, United for Wildlife and uh, Traffic and WWF uh, among like another a broader group of partners is to collate, to, to put together a compendium of red flags for wildlife trafficking through containerized cargo uh, that highlight uh, the most recent trafficking routes and modus operandi of, of traffickers. Uh, that will enable, and I'm confident will be a really useful tool for uh, the shipping sector to, um, to, to, to be able to sort of start recognizing some of, the, of those red flags, especially understanding whether you are based in a high risk country and, uh, and what you, know, you might be looking out for. And um, of course, these red flags also needs to be sort of like for any kind of trafficking, the modus operandi, the trafficking routes changing. As soon as you sort of put stronger enforcement at certain ports, then the trafficker, the trafficking flow is a fluid. So they will move to where there is more corruptions where they can, you know, uh, get, you know, some support, local support by the, the local authorities or, or, or the local uh, freight forwarders through bribes and so on in other ports. So it's important also to keep these red flags up to date. And, and we will also, uh, we're working with the United for Wildlife in, in terms of like, give the continuity uh, to that. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop here now. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. We have some time, so I want to take a few questions that are in the Q&A. Um, are, are the issues that we're seeing in the United States similar to the issues we're seeing in the European Union regarding wildlife trafficking? And if so, how does those, uh, does the EU versus the US uh, compare as far as aggressiveness of enforcement of trafficking laws? Uh, this can be to Monica or to anyone who uh, has input on this. I mean, maybe I can start in general, like from my understanding, uh, both, I cannot say both countries because the EU, <laughs> European Union is not a country, but the bloc and the US have really, um, have very good regulations in place, even uh, uh, to a certain extent stringent than, uh, than CITES. Um, they are so like um, in terms of recognizing the the, the sovereign foreign uh, laws for the protection and national level of, uh, for example, like timber. Um, the U.S. has the Lacey Act, and uh, and the EU has another like the timber regulations that also recognize um, the law from uh, from other non-EU countries, and and can prosecute per, uh, for that. So um, 
I would say in a way like they, they seem quite uh, similar and they take the issues very, uh, very strongly. And uh, in terms of their role in wildlife trafficking flows, they are perhaps not the key sort of um, for uh, containerized cargo, uh, the, the, you know, the, the really um, center of, of, of the trafficking, but they do play a role in transit, a very strong role in transit, and, um, and in part also as a sort of endpoint destinations. As we mentioned before, there's been uh, like cases of shipments of, um, especially like um, pills with, the, with medicinal plants uh, that are, you know, uh, traded illegally by sort of not complying with, uh, with CITES regulations. Or we have seen, uh, um, well, the US, uh, there was a recent, uh, uh, seizures in Hong Kong of, uh, of um, uh, American ginseng. Um, so, you know, even if, you know, we, we typically think of uh, those iconic species like the elephants or pangolins, but there are lots of uh, um, even plants uh, that are protected under CITES that, that are sort of not in the radar of, of customs. And uh, every now and then you hear about, I'm sure that there is much more to that. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll stop here. I don't know if uh, if uh, the group wants to add anything on the legislative side, for example. Another question that we're seeing in the Q&A is whether we think a blanket ban on possessing exotic animals would help in any, in all of this, or if not necessarily a blanket ban on exotic animals, if there are any other sort of bans that aren't currently in place that might help uh, decrease demand that's driving trafficking. This can be for anyone. Well, I think Eric, speaking, yeah. yeah, speaking only on the U.S. side, um, so where there isn't a blanket ban on exotic animals, um, would it help? Um, I think obviously yes, and there are proposals taking place. Um, for CITES and in international law pushing for a blanket ban. Um, it hasn't taken place yet because there's always opposition to uh, such a proposal. But um, I think, I think in, in the abstracts, which, is, which seems to be the way this question is phrased, um, I think the answer is obviously yes. Uh, you know, if, if the market dies down or disappears, then the, the, the trade correspondingly dies down with it. But that's also exactly a bit the problem. Like you can put a ban, uh, but if the demand is still there, uh, traffickers will still, you know, thrive in their business. And so, it really depends on uh, on the species. Like it's so diverse wildlife well, trade. Like we, it's an entrepot of, of, of very different uh, um, sort of type of trade or regulations or dynamics. So like if we think of the pet trade. Uh, it's very different from uh, shark fin trade or, or timber trade. So if, if a market is very well regulated, uh, then, then uh, maybe there is no need for a ban. But where there are like all those gray areas and loopholes, uh, then uh, the, the, legal, uh, the legal trade will be exploited to traffic um, look-alike species, for example. So it has to be uh, taken sort of uh, on a case by case, I would say. Thank you, Monica and Eric. We'll end with this final question from Madeline. It sounds like penalties can be significant as Eric touched on pre previously, but what percentage of traffickers are caught and or successfully prosecuted? In other words, is there enough enforcement to make the fines, penalties, an actual deterrent to trafficking? Any thoughts on uh, that or whether there need to be higher fines or penalties? So uh, I will uh, defer to Monica for more specifics on um, you know, what intelligence uh, she and traffic might have on this. But I think with any uh, commodity that's trafficked, um, there's always a problem that it's impossible to know the denominator 
just because of the nature of the business. This is all done uh, covertly. So um, I, I'm afraid that the answer, uh, unsatisfying as it might be, is that it's really impossible to answer uh, the first part of that question. Yeah, I would say the same. I would just add um, that as we've talked about today, I think it's the importance is seeing that there are developments in addition to Mark talking about the addition of wildlife trafficking to the RICO statute uh, as a predicate offense. Wildlife trafficking was also added as a predicate offense to mon money laundering in 2016, which has a uh, sentence of incarceration, a statutory maximum of up to 20 years imprisonment, plus the monetary fines attached to that. So I think that what we see and what we also see is that the Department of Justice is working with our international um, partners. Um, we even see where DOJ has sent um, certain types of special prosecutors to certain areas of uh, certain other countries where certain types of wildlife trafficking are more prevalent to help also to help train and investigations um, and to help investigate uh, these types of crimes. So I think you see international cooperation amongst the countries and you also see that where we can provide certain levels of expertise to certain countries, we are trying to do that. So I think you see um, efforts and continual efforts to um, help combat wildlife trafficking here and abroad, which speaks to um, the fact that these types of crimes are being taken seriously. And as we see more areas of development for levels of enforcement to make it less attractive, we're working on that with our international partners. Yeah, and I think just to, uh, just to chip in a, uh, on a more positive note, um, there are Lacey Act uh, success stories Yes. where species, uh, you know, for timber, like illegal timber, which we talked about, um, is one of them, where the trade and import of illegal timber in the U.S. has reduced dramatically after the Lacey Act Amendment was passed. And there are a number of uh, endangered species as well, which were put on the endangered species list and subsequently taken off because their numbers uh, rebounded um, after being uh, put under this protection. So I, I think they're you know, is there enough enforcement? It's hard to hard to say, but the enforcement that exists is having a positive effect. Thank you, Eric, Nicole, Mark. I think that's a great note on which to end. Uh, we are out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists today uh, for their contributions. And I'd also like to thank all the attendees for joining today to learn about this critical issue. Uh, with that, we will conclude today's program. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.